Uh, today, uh, we're going to be talking about serious matters because I think you would agree with me, we are living in serious times, yes? Uh, we see America changing before our eyes, and what happened in the election was just the result or the culmination of broader social changes within America over the last 20 to 30 years. And so the, the, our first uh, topic today is Wrong Think 2. I'd invite you to bow your heads with me, and we'll invite the presence of the Holy Spirit. So shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you are on your throne. Now, though the nations rage and rage at you, you hold them in derision. We want to thank you, Father, that your kingdom is a kingdom of justice and mercy and peace and love, and that one day Jesus will come through the clouds of glory, and all earthly kingdoms and all nations, including our own, will be wiped away, and an everlasting kingdom of grace will be established. So, Father, until that day, may we understand how we are to live in the midst of troubled times. I pray that you'll speak through me and for me. Let your Holy Spirit will speak to each of our hearts, whispering, this is the way, walk ye in it. We pray for the protection of our angels as we gather here today, and your blessing upon those who are here and those who are watching online. In the name of Jesus, we ask, amen. All right, so um, as you've come to guess, you know, I, I tend to deliver these religious liberty sermons, and it's not my first choice, I can assure you, but I find myself doing these religious liberty sermons once a year, and they're not kind of, um, they're not kind of uh, sermon lights, you know, they are, uh, they're, they're dealing with significant matters. And so today I invite you, you know, to keep, you need to keep your thinking caps on. Uh, we're going to look through um, some of the major words that our, our young people are growing up with these days, and we're going to ask ourselves, how do we understand this biblically? Is there a biblical response? Is there a biblical alternative to what is happening in our world today? And if so, what is that biblical alternative? So we're going to start out by setting the history. You know, it's important to set, lay out the historical context. Why? Because if you're divorced from your history, you're open to totalitarian regimes. The people who are divorced from history are open to authoritarianism because they don't know their past. They have lost their historical memory and they've lost their cultural memory. And therefore, as, um, as George Orwell said, whoever controls the past controls the future. So it's important that we understand the past in order to understand how we've got to where we are today. So we're going to start out, as we tend to do with these issues, in Europe in the mid-19th century. Uh, it was an era of profound economic and political and philosophical flux. Uh, during the Enlightenment, we, 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 we emphasized rationalism and reason and logic and scientific research and skepticism. And they were advancing against um, um, superstitionism, superstition and clericalism. But uh, along came, comes a guy in England who was a clergyman originally, Charles Darwin, who lived 1809 to 1882. And when he came out with his theory of evolution, he provided um, the foundation for a new worldview in our world today uh, without, uh, without having a Christian Im influence upon it. So with Charles Darwin, we have the possibility of a, an atheist worldview appearing in our world in the mid-1840s. Now, parallel to Darwin, we have this character here, Karl Marx. And he argued uh, in his writings that the working class should carry out organized revolutionary action to topple capitalism and bring about socioeconomic emancipation in which the government will be an all-powerful government, would control all resources and all means of production to, in theory, ensure equality. Now, Marx's ideas were first put into action in the Russian Revolution of 1917. My wife is from Russia. She has uh, great, great, great grandparents who lived and suffered through the Russian Revolution. They lost an awful lot during the Russian Revolution. He was followed then by Joseph Stalin, one of the uh, worst mass murderers in human history, the head of the Union of Socialist Soviet Republics, or USSR. And uh, he lived 1878, 1878 to 1953. And now the imposition of socialist doctrine came at enormous cost. I, I find it astonishing today that, that many people have no idea of the history here. But the history is, is pretty simple. Uh, the imposition of Karl Marx's doctrines, uh, there you see a map on the screen of the concentration camps and the re-education camps across the Soviet Union. And there you have uh, uh, Magadan, there's Vladivostok down there, those are the island of Sakhalin, labor camps. Here you have up in the Arctic Circle, here Murmansk in Russian there. The Arctic Circle is around here, everything north of this. And uh, in, these, in these camps, tens of millions of people passed through during the time of the Soviet Union. It was a horrendous era. Countless Soviet citizens, innocent citizens, perished in labor camps, 
in concentration camps, in mass population deportations, mass executions, show trials, the collectivization of the agricultural sector. In the Ukraine in the 1930s, Joseph Stalin took all the grain from the small farmers and he created a man-made famine. It was called the Holodmor, and uh, between four and six million people were deliberately starved to death because they had small holding farms, and that was against socialist doctrine. Uh, you see there are some pictures of some of the camps and the killing fields of the Soviet Union. There was the terror, the, the purge of anti-revolutionary forces in the 1930s, in which Stalin encouraged people to write letters of denunciation about your boss. If you don't like your boss, accuse him of being um, an agitator against socialism, and he would disappear. He would simply be cancelled, uh, either executed or sent to a, a camp for the rest of his life. Marxist theories were then imposed elsewhere in the world. Um, for those who are familiar with history, the Khmer Rouge, or the Red Khmer in French, or the Killing Fields of Cambodia, uh, by Mao Cadres in China, the Cultural Revolution, in which, again, tens of millions of people perished. Many Christians initially supported the Cultural Revolution, only to discover, as in most revolutions in the last 200 years, that those who support the revolutions are often the first victims of those revolutions. But tens of, me, tens of millions perished in China during their Cultural Revolution. That was in my lifetime and most of your lifetime. And uh, most recently, we have the example of Venezuela, which is perhaps the richest nation on earth, or it should be, given its oil reserves. And yet a recent World, um, United Nations report says over 90% are living in abject poverty uh, after the imposition of a one-party Marxist state. Now, if you, do, if you add up the numbers in the 20th century alone, uh, historians estimate that over 110 million people died um, at the hands of Marxist ideology. That's just those who died. That's not counting those who were dehumanized and imprisoned indefinitely, some for 10 or 25 year sentences. Now, the publication in 1973 of this book here, The Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, it demolished any pretense to moral authority on the part of Marxist thinking. And why was that? Uh, Solzhenitsyn essentially said that if a system can only survive by imprisoning and executing tens of millions of its own citizens, then that system has no moral authority. And I think we would agree with that as Christians today. No system has any moral authority if it can only survive by executing by the millions its own citizens. And that's precisely what happened during the 20th century with Marxist ideology. So after the publication of this book, um, Marxist ideologues, they moved on and they came up with something called critical theory. Now, Marx understood the world as being a struggle between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, that is the factory owners and the workers, and the workers are gonna re rebel and uh, have a, a dictatorship of the proletariat, as he called it. But from the 1960s onwards, um, these theorists came up with critical theory. Now, Karl Marx understands the world from economic relationships, and critical theory understands the world through power relationships. So critical theory, which is the basis for social justice warriors, is not actually concerned with justice per se, it is concerned with power and the allocation of power within a given society. It's a critical, critical point to understand. Social justice warriors are not looking for justice, they're looking for power redistribution. That's the essential worldview that they have uh, when they look at the world today. Now, within critical theory, you have a variety of areas of critical thinking. There's critical race theory, which we will discuss this afternoon, intersectional feminism, critical sexuality studies, post-colonial studies, indigenous studies, fat studies, black studies, and the list goes on and on and on. And uh, these all share the same, essentially, Marxist worldview of understanding power relationships within a given society. Now, there was an Italian Marxist scholar called Antonio Gramsci, and he developed the concept of hegemony. This is the, the idea that there is a dominance of one set of ideas over society, and this is expressed as oppression uh, by the oppressors over the oppressed. And in America today, we hear a lot about white supremacy. This is a classic expression of hegemony where concepts such as being on time for meetings is viewed as white supremacy. Uh, the value of hard work is viewed now as white supremacy. Uh, the importance of the nuclear family, mother, father, and children, is white supremacy. This is the hegemony or the dominance of one set of ideas or norms around which everything else in society um, must orient itself. And so, um, based on this idea, this idea of Gramsci, we come to what is famously known in, in the academic world as the Frankfurt School. And the Frankfurt School was a bunch of scholars who left um, Nazi Germany and uh, parts of Europe in the 1930s, and they were applying the tools of critical theory and uh, Marxist thinking 
and they were trying to understand why does Marxism not take root in liberal democracies with the Judeo-Christian foundation? That was their essential purpose. Why does Marxism not take over in the West? You see the names of their key scholars up there, and that's a typo, is Horkheimer, not Hormheimer, but nonetheless, um, these are some of the key scholars. Now, Horkheimer, he wrote, and he actually described what is a critical theory as opposed to a traditional theory. Now, let me just under help just share this. If you're an anthropologist, your job is to observe a society in work and in action in order to understand how and why it operates, yes? And an anthropologist does not intervene in that society. They're simply observing to understand the social dynamics. That is the role of an anthropologist and to a certain extent of a sociologist. And that is a traditional way of looking at things. Uh, whereas critical theory, and this is what Horkheimer himself says, he says, whereas a traditional theory is meant to be descriptive of some phenomenon, usually social, such as anthropology, and aims to understand how it works and why it works that way, a critical theory should proceed from a prescriptive, normative, moral vision for society. That is, a critical theorist approaches his or her observation from the perspective that we need to, there's a, um, an ideal that we need to strive for. And uh, they describe how the item being critiqued, such as America today, fails that vision, usually in a systemic sense, this was written in the 1930s, and prescribe activism to subvert, dismantle, disrupt, overthrow, or change it. This use of the word critical is drawn from Marx's insistence that everything be ruthlessly criticized and from his admonition that the point of studying society is to change it. So you see this language, this is going back 60 years, and this is what we're hearing in the news today. The purpose of critical theory is not to understand any society, it's to subvert it from within, to problematize everything, criticize everything, say that everything is problematic so that people are so discouraged they give up the fight from within and then that nation becomes, it just falls into a Marxist one-party totalitarian state. This is what is happening in America today and it's affecting freedom of speech and inevitably it will affect freedom of conscience as we will see in our second sermon today, the rise of totalitarianism in America today. So, a critical theory does not seek to understand what is, it seeks to impose a new vision of a secular atheist dictatorship underpinned by Marxist dogma. And so you might say that the roots of the tree are atheism, the trunk of the tree is Karl Marx, and then the branches are the areas of critical study, um, fat studies, LGBTQ studies, post-colonial studies, etc., etc., which are all recognized areas of academic study these days. So uh, we're going to focus today on two of the branches of critical theory, um, two of the branches that you probably hear a lot about, two of the branches that you hear about on the news almost on a daily basis, and they are diversity and inclusion. And what is meant by these two phrases? Because you've all heard the phrases diversity and inclusion, yes? So what, what is meant by diversity and inclusion? And it's really important to understand that language has been weaponized in America in the last 10 years. Language no longer means what you think it means. You may think that diversity means X, but it actually does not mean anything like X, as we're going to discover here today in the eyes of critical theorists. So we're going to, first of all, look at crit uh, diversity. Now, contrary to what you may assume, Diversity does not mean putting together a team that differs along ethnic, uh, national origin, or gender-based lines. So, for instance, in, in our Lake Union here, um, up until the, the retirement of our executive secretary, our president um, is an African-American, our treasurer has a Hispanic heritage, and our secretary um, has a white Caucasian heritage. So we have, you might say, black, brown, and white, to put it crudely. Is that diversity? We may think it is, but no, the answer is no. Why? Because those three individuals all share a biblical worldview. So just having different colors does not mean diversity. Having different sexes, male or female in your team, does not represent diversity. Diversity does not mean putting together a team that represents different socioeconomic, educational, or even life experience backgrounds. This is not diversity within critical theory dogma. You may think that's what diversity is, but that is not what diversity is according to the theoreticians. In critical theory, a person's identity and their politics are inextricably linked. There's identity politics and intersectionality. And diversity is only achieved in critical theory by assembling a diverse representation of lived experiences of oppression. Please understand this. Diversity is only accomplished when you reject the biblical worldview 
and you adopt a Marxist atheist worldview, and you interpret the world through the lens of oppressors and oppressed, and diversity is only accomplished when you have all the people down here who are the oppressed, who they may be LGBTQ, whatever else they, they may happen to be, or you know, um, you know, all the other characteristics that people cling to identity groups, and they, even though they're mutually in incompatible with one another, they all share a hatred of, of the oppressors, and they all share a hatred of the biblical worldview. This is what it means, diversity within critical theory writing. Thus, to hire a racially black individual, but not a politically black individual, is not diversity. Why? Because such an individual is allegedly suffering from internalized racism, has a brainwashed subconscious, and is an unwitting accomplice to white supremacy, and they are to be rejected. If you are, for instance, a person of color but have a biblical worldview, you do not count in the diversity stakes. That's why uh, Vice President Biden could say, if you don't vote for me, you ain't black, to quote him literally. Why? Because a black has become a political identity rather than an ethnic or cultural identity. So thus it is today that if a man, an African-American man, does not subscribe to critical theory, if he, for instance, believes that a man is not only to father a child but to be a father to a child, if he believes in the divinely ordained nuclear family, he is not authentically black within the viewpoint, the worldview of critical theorists today. He is to be demonized. He is to be destroyed. Now, many of you may or may not have heard of Kanye West, a very famous hip-hop artist in America today. And he has deviated from the ideological reservation of critical theory, and he has been destroyed by the critical theorists in popular culture today. He's viewed as being mentally ill, vulnerable, bipolar, or a race traitor. So what does this mean in practice? Well, let me go back. I don't want that slide just yet. What does this mean in practice? Well, diversity means hiring people of different ethnic, national, sexual orientation, biological sex, or gender identity backgrounds, all with different subjective lived expressions of oppression, but who all think identically as Christ-hating critical theorists intent on problematizing absolutely everything about the organization they work in and the nation they live in, in all in order to subvert it from within, eliminate the Judeo foundation Christians of our, foundations of our society, replace the biblical worldview with an atheist worldview, and eliminate democracy in favor of an all-powerful Marxist dictatorship. That is what diversity means within the literature. Does that sound a pleasing or a pleasant option? Probably not. Now, within your own institution, um, the Italian Marxist scholar Antonio Gramsci, he, he talks about the concept of the long march. Now, if you are uh, from history, uh, when Mao Zedong conquered the nationalists in the Chinese uh, Civil War that led to the Chinese Communist Party um, taking power in China, the Red Army engaged in what was known as the long march. It was a long march to victory. And for many years, Mao Zedong and his generals led the communist armies against the nationalist armies of Chiang Kai-shek. And there was the concept of the long march. It literally was a long march to victory. Now, the theorists have evolved the concept of the long march. And, uh, and the idea is that the West is to be eliminated and our freedoms are to be eliminated through the long march, the long march in which our Judeo-Christian Judeo foundations are to be subverted from within to be replaced with an atheist worldview and a one-party Marxist dictatorship. And the best way to do it within your institution is to hire people who promote diversity and inclusion. And, you, and again, what they say diversity and inclusion is isn't necessarily what they mean by that. And so um, that is how we, what we're seeing in, in America today. Uh, that we have these dogmas coming up, you know, like diversity is our strength. Have you ever thought to think about, have you stopped to think about that for a minute? Diversity is our strength. Well, can you think of any human institution in human history where the less we have in common, the more likely we are to succeed? That's a simple question. If diversity truly is our strength, is there any institution in human history where the less we have in common, the more likely we are to succeed? I can't think of anything in history where the less we have in common, the more likely we are to succeed. Simply that's not true. And so diversity is, is an ideological term that is used, and people of goodwill, they say, yes, we believe in diversity without realizing what is meant by diversity. Diversity really means that we all share a critical worldview. We all share an atheist worldview. We are rejecting the biblical worldview. And if anybody strays off that reservation, they are to be canceled or destroyed. We'll talk about cancel culture in our second sermon today and the impact of totalitarianism. But a classic example is the author of the Harry Potter books. What's her name? Does anybody remember? J.K. Rowling. 
and a very leading feminist in, in Britain. And uh, she questioned last year whether, um, and there was a court case, and she questioned whether um, a, a, a man could, could actually claim to be a woman. She questioned transgender ideology, and she was subsequently trashed and canceled by the, the, the social justice warriors. And so she strayed off the ideological reservation, and she's been destroyed as a result of that. And so they, people eat their own when they get involved in this kind of worldview. So we talked about diversity for a minute. Let's talk about inclusion. Now, if diversity, you might say, is dangerous from a work, biblical worldview perspective, inclu inclusion is insidious. Because again, what you imagine inclusion to mean does not equate to what it means for trained Marxist activists. Language has been weaponized, and these words no longer mean what you thought they used to mean. Now, you may imagine that inclusion means building a team or an organization or a society, and we create space and mechanisms for all, all voices to be heard. I think we would all want that in a society. We want a society where every voice can be heard. We want a church where every voice can be heard. We want organizations where every voice can have a place at the table and, and everybody's input is, is valued. But that is not what inclusion really means. That's the key point. What you think it means is not what it actually means within the ideology. Inclusion means turning your organization into a safe space. Now, have you heard the phrase safe space? Some of you must have heard the phrase a safe space. This is a safe space. Colleges all across America of every kind are now declaring themselves to be safe spaces, and many employers are now saying we are safe spaces. Now, what, does it, what is meant within the critical theory worldview by a safe space? It means an inclusive environment that cannot allow feelings of marginalization or exclusion for any protected group or their authentic voices. Their narrative of, you cannot challenge their narrative of subjective lived expression, experience or of alleged oppression. Now, what this means in practice is that uh, if I go to a public school and I declare myself a penguin, nothing in that public school campus can ever be used to deny that I'm a penguin. Nothing can be, nobody can question it. Everybody must affirm that. And anybody who questions my identity as a penguin then you are guilty of a microaggression, and that is hate speech, and you must be deplatformed. Are you following me on this, yes? I'm using an extreme example, but you smile, but this thing is coming down the pike. Once we have transgender, you'll have trans species. People are already claiming to be trans species, and then you must accept it. And so inclusion means that the mere presence of individuals, books, speeches, or any idea in any format that disagrees with the dogma of any protected group is to be denounced as a microaggression that causes trauma and harm. This is one reason why people, by the tens of thousands in the last two weeks alone, have been purged from social media, because you're speaking wrong think. You're speaking truths that we know are self-evident but are no longer acceptable to the critical theorists and the social justice warriors. And that is why famous speakers are being deplatformed from colleges. If you are a conservative speaker or a, a preacher, you try and speak at University College Ber University of California, Berkeley. They'll be rioting on the streets. They will deplatform you because your mere presence on campus is a microaggression because you walking across that college campus is a standing rebuke to the ideology of that campus. And so that is why we are seeing um, the, 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 the um, totalitarian clampdown on any ideas that can be expressed in American universities. In practice, it requires actively restricting speech, discussion, or activity that will not foster a positive psychological experience for a marginalized, protected, or oppressed group. Everything must be positively affirmed. Does this affect Adventist campuses? Yes, it does. The net effect of inclusion means that those who speak the gospel of Jesus Christ, and in particular of victory over the sins of the flesh, such as coming out ministries, are being deplatformed across Adventist campuses. Why? The gospel voice must be closed down, for the call to repentance is now interpreted as a microaggression, an act of violence against protected groups and their personal truths, their subjective lived experiences, which cannot be challenged in any way. Now, I recognize that what I'm saying is not politically correct, but I'm speaking the truth. Nothing can be allowed that questions the authenticity of the experience of every individual. And so on our campuses today, the gospel called to repentance and faith is slowly being closed down. Uh, we had to have here a video from Coming Out Ministries a few years ago. Now, why was that? Why couldn't it be played on an Adventist campus just down the road? Ask yourself that question. 
The biblical worldview on our campuses is being overthrown and it's being replaced by an atheist worldview and we are starting to churn out functional atheists. How does this work in practice? Well, speakers are deplatformed. Statues of Jesus in the last year have been torn down across America. The mobs on the streets have been burning Bibles. Online cult mobs terrorize the non-compliant. Cancel culture stalks the land. This is soft totalitarianism. Americans are now afraid to speak their minds. Uh, survey after survey shows that Americans are now self-censoring before they put anything on social media. And the, given the fact that most of us have got smartphones, I don't have mine with me, but more and more Americans, it seems to me, are self-censoring what they say at home. More and more Americans are self-censoring what they say in the privacy of their own bedrooms. Because what you say today will be taken down and used in evidence against you tomorrow. Physical mobs are battering those who disagree with the dominant narrative. So inclusion in summary only means allowing people to think, speak and act in groveling subservience to the daily shifting and nonsensical demands of atheist critical theory adhering diversity hires. Now that's quite a sentence. So please keep your thinking caps on as we go through this. So how do we respond to all this as Christians? Well, um, we, we want to say that, first of all, that we are all fallen sinners without hope other than through the saving grace of Jesus Christ. That Jesus came to save all peoples of every nation, tribe, language, and people. That every person within every culture is equally important and valid to God. That all people are created in the image of God. And to deny the image of God in somebody else is, is an affront to our Creator. We all need a savior. The only basis for our salvation is the grace of God, received by faith without, with repentance, not through any intrinsic individual merit. So while we utterly reject the atheist dogma of diversity and inclusion, we speak in love to those who are trapped within this dogma because it is um, a mental reservation. And if you go off that reservation, you will be destroyed, for they are also the object of God's love and his redemptive plans. And so I'm gonna compare now, systematically on the screen, I put this chart together, I don't know, the fall last year, a comparison of the diversity and inclusion worldview with the biblical worldview. We're going to look at a number of dimensions. So, for instance, the question of God himself. In the diversity and inclusion worldview, God does not exist. And in diversity and inclusion worldview, Christianity is responsible for the oppression of marginalized groups and is an intrinsic expression of white supremacy. Now, the fact that, for instance, the vast majority of Christians in our world today are persons of color is kind of irrelevant because, again, we're not dealing with facts, we're dealing with dogma here. According, uh, in the biblical worldview, the fool saith in his heart that there is no God. And having turned their backs on God, as the Apostle Paul says, they become futile in their thinking and their senseless minds were darkened. In terms of identity, another marker, uh, important thing these days, well, in diversity and inclusion of the critical theory worldview, your identity, um, you're a member of a social group, you're either oppressor or oppressed, and everybody is looking to be one of the oppressed groups, everybody's looking to be a victim, that's when you get brownie points, as defined by intersectionality and identity politics. Let me just show you how ridiculous this is. Um, I'm a white heterosexual male, so I'm guilty of all the evil in human history. But wait a minute, I'm actually a white... Um, homosexual male, which means I'm now a victim, just like that. I'm not responsible for the evils of human history. And now I identify as a person of color who is transgender. That's my identity, you must accept it. Now I'm the most oppressed group in human history. Oh, now it's um, 1035, now I'm back a male, heterosexual, white male. Now I'm guilty of all the sins of human history. Does this not strike you as absurd? It's utterly absurd. In the biblical worldview, all, keep, all people are created in the image of God with equal moral worth. And that is what we are called to uphold as Christians today. In terms of sin, in diversity and inclusion, there is no concept of sin per se. There are no moral restraints within critical theory. The oppressed experience oppression and all actions against the oppressors are thereby justified, which is why when the, li the rioting and the looting and the murder and all the rest, the mayhem in America in the last year is cheered on because there's no concept of sin. The, the oppressed can do whatever they want to the oppressors. There's no consequences. Whereas in the biblical worldview, Genesis 1 through 3 and Romans 1 through 3 teach that we all created the image of God. This image has been marred by the fall. There is no one who is righteous, not even one. All are morally accountable before God for their actions, regardless of your group identity. 
we will stand before God one day. We will have to answer for our words and for our deeds. There is a final judgment. And when you have no concept of the final judgment, then you can do whatever you like today because there are no eternal consequences. When it comes to ultimate authority in the critical theory worldview, ultimate authority is your personal, subjective, lived experience. That phrase, lived experience, is what you're going to see in the you see it in the literature today. You hear it on CNN and on Fox. This is part of the language which our young people are learning in colleges. Your lived experience is your final determinant of truth. If it's true to how I feel today, then it's fine. But if it disagrees with how I feel today, then, then what, you, what you were saying must be hate speech and you must be deplatformed and cancelled. Uh, this is what is happening. People are unable to accept opposing viewpoints anymore. We're unable to discuss ideas anymore because if it contradicts my subjective lived experience, by definition, it must be hate speech. In the biblical worldview, the ultimate authority is not my subjective lived experience, but it is the word of God, which is absolute, eternal, and it is external to any human being. Rather than deifying ourselves, making ourselves out to be gods, we actually submit to the word of God. We come to the scripture as Christians not to sit in judgment on the scripture, but allow the scriptures to sit in judgment upon us. We humble ourselves before God, and we allow the word of God to read our hearts and our minds that we might be changed on a daily basis. In terms of desired living space, in the diversity and inclusion worldview, uh, what is really desired is a safe space in which any personal, subjective, lived experience cannot be questioned, removing the physical presence of any who question the validity of my lived experience. So that is why speakers are being deplatformed across America. People are being cut off from social media. Nothing can be allowed to question the latest crazy idea. From a biblical perspective, our desired living space is nowhere here on earth, but it's actually on heaven, where the saints of God will dwell, drawn from every nation, every tribe, every language, every people, from all backgrounds, where we can live together and the tree of life will provide fruit for the healing of the nations. Only God can provide the healing in our world today and will be free of disease, death, sorrow, and suffering. Uh, if there a call to repentance, well, in the, in the critical theory worldview, a, a call to repentance is a microaggression that must be silenced because nothing can be allowed to challenge your subjective lived experience or to disturb your safe space. When, the, when John the Baptist came in the Gospels, the first word he spoke was repent. Why? For the kingdom of God is at hand. When Jesus came in the Gospels, the first word he spoke were repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The very call to repent is now rejected as a microaggression because if, if Jesus says to me, Conrad, I want you to repent, what he's saying is, Conrad, something is not right in your life. And that's the truth. Something is not right in my life. I am a sinner. And so the call to repentance, the gospel call, is now a microaggression that must be closed down. Now, I'm not a prophet, but it's not going to be long before the Bible is going to be declared hate speech in many parts of America. It's going that way. This is where we're going as a nation. The biblical model, the biblical worldview, we are to repent, we are to believe, we are to be baptized, and we are to receive the Holy Spirit. And so we, we, we recognize that we are sinners, that our safe space really is, is actually, a, our safe space is actually a one-way ticket to eternal damnation. And we are called to repent, to believe, to be baptized, have our sins of the past washed away, and to receive the Holy Spirit that God might change us more and more daily into the character of Jesus, if Jesus, Jesus Christ himself. And so the first call of Jesus was to repent and believe in the good news, Mark 1.15. Forgiveness. There is no forgiveness in diversity and inclusion. Instead, we have cancel cultures. We, if you stay for the second service, I'm going to be talking about the difference between hard totalitarianism and soft totalitarianism. We have now descended to soft totalitarianism in America. It's happening right around us, right around our faces. Every day it's in the news, if you believe the news. And so now we have cancel culture. If you stray from the ideological reservation, you will become a non-person. We'll destroy you not just on social media, but we'll destroy you economically. The banks will withdraw from you. The credit card processors will withdraw from you. Gmail will withdraw from you. Everything will be destroyed. You'll become a non-person. You'll physically live, but nobody will have any business with you. Now, the book of Revelation says, Revelation 13, look at some of the characteristics. It says, Revelation 13 says that the mark of the beast will be imposed uh, either on the head or on the forehead. I'm sorry, their forehead or the hand, which implies that at the end of time, society will be polarized. Some will accept the mark of the beast willingly. Some will accept the mark of the beast only by co uh, force. We are now living in a polarized world and a polarized society. It makes absolute sense. 
And so um, we see in the Revelation 13 that those who do not receive the mark of the beast, they will be killed. They will neither buy nor sell. This is known as cancel culture. The ingredients of Revelation 13 are coming into place in front of our very eyes. Now, what, they're not targeting Christians just yet, but one day it will, that target will be those who are faithful to Jesus Christ. The biblical worldview is repentance is possible. Praise the Lord. We can be uh, forgiven through confession, repentance, and receiving the gift of grace. And diversity and inclusion, diversity and inclusion, diverse lived experiences of oppression are celebrated. The oppressed have dual insight, or that's going to be a standpoint epistemology. By that, it means that um, uh, because I'm a white heterosexual male and I'm cisgender, well, that means my gender identity aligns with my bodily reality, okay? That's the terminology that is used. Because I'm in that group, that means I'm an oppressor. But if this person over here is a white um, gay male, that means he sees the world from his perspective and from my perspective, so he has dual insight. Whereas I, as an oppressor, only see the world from my perspective and I cannot see it from his perspective. So that means the, more, the lower down the victimhood flow chart you appear, the more insight you have. That means the more truth you have, that means the more you need to be listened to. Are you following the logic on this? All right. So this is what is happening in America today. Whereas in the biblical perspective, the whole, in terms of diversity, the Holy Spirit gives diverse gifts to whomsoever he wishes, regardless of who you are regardless of the color of your skin, regardless of whether you're male or female, young or old, regardless of your education level or your wealth level, the Holy Spirit is sovereign and gives gifts to whomsoever he wishes. And the body is not complete with all of those gifts, thus eliminating any cause for pride or one-upmanship or demeaning within the body of Christ. And your immutable personal characteristics are Im immaterial as far as God is concerned. God does not care whether you have blue eyes or brown eyes. God does not care whether you have blonde hair, black hair or red hair. It is not important to God the color of your skin or your education level or how much money you have in the bank. We are equally valued, honored, created in his image and loved by Jesus Christ. And so biblical worldview does talk about diversity, but the diversity is not in immutable personal characteristics like race, gender, ex or sex or sexual orientation. It is the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to his church. And we can be a standing rebuke to the world when we learn to love one another in the body of Christ and care for one another in the body of Christ and say we will transcend the barriers that the world is putting up around us. Then we learn to represent the kingdom of God in truth in this, in this fallen and broken world. The world is dividing us, intersectionality. We are called to come together and to value and to love all peoples within our congregations. And unity, uh, well, political unity is found when antithetically opposed groups, this is in the diversity and inclusion worldview, such as LGs and Ts, who are actually fighting each other. Let lesbians and gays are philosophically opposed to the transgender movement. They're philosophically incompatible. They hate each other. There's no such thing as the LGBT community. There's the LGBTQ civil war, effectively. They philosophically are antithetically opposed to each other. But political unity is found when these antithetically opposed groups among themselves join in fighting alleged oppression and ideological anti-God uniformity is ruthlessly enforced in the nation by a political correctness, Hollywood, the mainstream media, social media, the corrupt national media, activist corporations, anti-Christian professors, cancel culture, anti-racism training, implicit bias testing, diversity and inclusion training, diversity and inclusion commissars, and Antifa mobs on the streets. This is what is happening all around us. We are being frog-marched into a new world, a brave new world in which probably countless people are going to suffer in profound ways. The biblical worldview is that unity is, doesn't come from human beings, but it's nurtured by the Holy Spirit. And we find unity by living lives of sacrificial service one for another. Lead a life, as the Apostle Paul said, worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, for there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. I love that biblical understanding of unity, don't you? That the Holy Spirit can lead us into unity and we, we can cooperate with God in building unity by intentionally serving one another in love. 
looking out for one another, caring for one another, speaking up for one another, walking with one another, encouraging with one another, one another, praying for one another, and so forth and so forth. That is the world in which I want to live. I'll care for you today because I know that tomorrow when I need some help, somebody's gonna stand by me as well. And that's the kind of uh, unity that we find within the word of God. It is not found within diversity and inclusion. And then uh, finally there we have, no, we've got two more slides here. Time is moving on. Truth, diversity and inclusion, there are no absolutes. In diversity and inclusion, truth is subjective, situational, and individual. That this is your truth. Remember Oprah Winfrey? She says, this be true to your truth. She doesn't say be, be, true, be, be true to the truth. She says, be true to your truth. And because everybody has a different subjective lived experience, that means truth varies with every individual. A society collapses if we can't agree on anything. You know, it's very simple. Societies collapse when you can no longer agree on anything. In the biblical worldview, truth is absolute, and it's external to the human experience. Scientific and moral absolutes do exist. It is a sin to lie. It is a sin to murder. It is a sin to commit adultery. These are not situationally justified. These are absolute moral standards. This truth is also validated by scientific research and respectful dialogue, and Jesus Christ himself is the ultimate truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus does not say, I am a way, I am a truth, and I am a life. I am the way, the truth, the life, which is why the world hates Jesus so much, because he offers the exclusive way to salvation to God the Father, as opposed to the inclusive views of our world today where all roads lead to God. No, we only come to our, to our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. Then we have the temporal goal. What is the goal here on earth? Well, in critical theory or diversity and inclusion, the temporal goal is atheist equity, that there are equal outcomes on all dimensions for all racial groups. That's the goal where we're going to in America right now. Now, if you look at the charts of American society, um, you know, there's, there's multiple groups. There's like the Filipino Americans, the Indian Americans, the Korean Americans, the Taiwanese Americans, the Sri Lankan Americans, the Nigerian Americans, all have better socioeconomic outcomes than white Americans do. But we are allegedly a white supremacist society, even though the whites are way down the list in terms of average income. But the temporal goal of diversity and inclusion is to have equal outcomes for every group in society. Now, how do you get that? It requires an all-powerful government engineering equal social outcomes across all racial or protected groups, regardless of personal opportunity, regardless of personal effort, regardless of personal investment, regardless of personal responsibility. And that society, I would suggest to you, is fundamentally unjust. Why is it unjust? I have a twin brother. Let's say that we both studied hard and made our way through life, but let's say that he, studied hard, and I chose to become a drug addict, drug addict. Why should the government then engineer things so we both have the same standard of living when we're 50, when I've blown my mind and money on drugs and he's spent his whole life working hard? So the moment you say everybody has to have equal outcomes, identical outcomes, you're creating an unjust society where it doesn't matter what effort you put into life, everybody gets the same. We've tried this before in the world. It was known as the Soviet Union. When I worked in the Soviet Union, when the Soviet Union stopped, everything stopped. Okay, and why did it stop? Because in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, people realized that when you went to work, if you did a good job or you did a bad job, you're still gonna get the same amount of money. Guess what people did? They did a bad job. When you bought a car, a brand new car in the Soviet Union, you had to buy a new car and you maybe buy another car for spare parts because the first brand new car wasn't fully made. Why? Because the workers didn't care. The only car factories in the world where the value of the car was worth less than the value of the raw materials coming into the start of the factory, which is absurd, was the Ladas and the Nevas, the famous cars in the Soviet Union. It was a value-reducing activity to make a car. And so people would go to work and just sleep through the day because you're gonna get the same outcome. Why work? And if you insist on a society where everybody gets the same outcome, then nobody has any incentive to work hard. And society just collapses. We've seen it in the Soviet Union. We had a 70-year experiment and it collapsed, and we're going that direction again in our society. In the biblical worldview, in terms of temporal goal, rather than looking for equity, which is equal outcomes, we're looking for God-fearing equality, that is equal standing and treatment before the law, Leviticus 19.15, and equal opportunity for all, uh, based on the year of Jubilee. But there are a personal responsibility for temporal and eternal outcomes. If you do not work, says the Apostle Paul, then what happens? 
you do not eat. You must contribute to your own welfare and your own life. And whereas the critical theory viewpoint wants an all-powerful government that engineers everything, the biblical worldview looks for a limited government whose role is to foster equal opportunities for personal growth and human flourishing. And we are seeing in America before our eyes the growth of an all-powerful government that will determine which rights you do and do not have. So, eternal outcomes. We're almost finished now. There are no eternal outcomes in diversity and inclusion. Biblical worldview, God wishes for all to receive eternal life, but most will be lost for eternity despite the offer of salvation to all who believe. And freedom of conscience, there is none. The individual must give way to the atheist, Jesus-rejecting, God-hating, social justice warrior mob rule. And in the biblical worldview, we have absolute freedom of conscience. God never compels, but he always respects the conscience of a human being. God offers us salvation. Why, O Israel, wilt thou die? Turn, O Israel, and live. I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says God. And the Old Testament prophets, he wants all to be saved, but he does not compel us to accept the gift of salvation. So what do you say in conclusion today? Well, biblical teachings in general, and on religious liberty in particular, freedom of conscience, it calls us to reject entirely the underlying atheism and the application of critical theory and Marxist ideology in our world today. We are facing in America today uh, the rising of an ideology that is responsible for more death and human suffering than any other ideology in history. That ideology is now seeking to subvert and to destroy the very freedoms of conscience, speech, and worship that we have grown accustomed to within the United States. We are called by God today to pray for our leaders, to pray for our church leaders, to pray for our institutional leaders, to pray for ministry leaders, to pray for our pastors, that we will not be subverted from within by diversity and inclusion militants, regardless of who they are or where they're from, that we will not be pushed into an anti-God, Christian-persecuting, Christ-rejecting, Jesus-hating, truth-rejecting, Bible-burning, preacher-deplatforming, atheist, atheist ideology in the way we do church or in the way we teach our children in our institutions. We are called, rather, to live lives of sacrificial love, selfless love, as Christ has first loved us for all humanity, regardless of who they are or where they come from or what they look like and how they dress and how they talk, for everybody is in desperate need of the sin-bearing Savior. We are to love our neighbors as ourselves. We love others as Christ first loved us, and we seek not only the best outcome for ourselves in society, but for our neighbor, and we calibrate our actions and our words accordingly. Such love is active. It is intentional. It is forgiving. It is seeking for reconciliation, building up of peace, and works to labor for the unity in the body of Christ. So my challenge to you today is rather than swallowing whole without thinking about it, the, the, the doomed teachings of a dead Karl Marx and his philosophy, philosophy of futility, I want to challenge you today to be ambassadors for the living and the coming Savior, for without him we are all doomed to eternal destruction, yet with him we may find forgiveness for yesterday, meaning for today, and hope for tomorrow. So live for Jesus in the coming week. Amen.